My name is Dr. Shiv Kumar Singh. I'm a consultant in anesthesia at uh, Royal Liverpool University Hospitals. Today I'm going to talk about regional anesthesia in patients uh, with a suspected COVID infection. I have nothing to declare financially and uh, some of the images are courtesy Google. In Chinese, uh, crisis is represented uh, by two symbols and uh, one of them is uh, for danger, other is opportunity. So in every crisis lies the seed of opportunity. So what are the dangers? We all know about how uh, COVID is spread, how it affects the lungs, which might require admission to the hospital uh, where you'll be tested uh, for that and ever elusive uh, the vaccine for uh, Corona. And because we don't have any vaccination, any protection, we need to wear PPE and people need to be in mask uh, in the hospital as well as in the public places. So that, that is the danger we all are aware of. So where is the opportunity here? The opportunity here lies in the regional anesthesia. That is the use of regional anesthesia uh, for cases uh, coming to theaters uh, who may be uh, COVID positive. So we had to look at the balance uh, between GA or regional anesthesia and see the cases which can be done purely under regional anesthesia. And that means that if you are actually going to choose regional anesthesia, then the conversion from the regional to GA should almost be 0%. The European Society of Regional Anesthesia and the ASRA, that is American Society of Regional Anesthesia, came out with this guidance for regional anesthesia. And they have said that regional anesthesia is preferred over general anesthesia for patients with COVID-19 to reduce the risk of transmission. Cochrane also uh, you know, produced this uh, special collection uh, way back in May 2020, and which said that coronavirus uh, COVID-19 regional anesthesia uh, to reduce drug use in anesthesia and avoid aerosol generation. And they had this collection of articles which actually suggested how regional anesthesia is better than general anesthesia uh, for certain situations. So we all know that general anesthesia requires airway intervention. Uh, this can exacerbate the COVID-19 pneumonia. And because of the airway intervention, there is aerosol generation, uh, which can uh, risk COVID transmission to the medical staff. Whereas, we look at regional anesthesia, it's not an aerosol generating procedure. And not only that, it also provides superior analgesia. Uh, there are patient, surgical, institutional, environmental benefits like reduced post operative complications. And it reduces the time spent in the recovery and which translates into early hospital discharge. So COVID does uh, affect the lungs and uh, the patients can be admitted to the hospital because of this. But even if the patient actually hasn't got any respiratory symptoms, uh, we actually know that respiratory complications uh, occur more commonly in patients who have had respiratory infection. So uh, the respiratory infection is like an independent predictor uh, for post-operative respiratory complication. So in cases of non-urgent surgeries uh, with respiratory infection, that includes COVID-19, uh, we should postpone and reschedule uh, these surgeries after the infection is treated. And that also means that if these patients come back after, even after the infection is treated, uh, if it is possible, then regional anesthesia should be an option uh, for these patients. There isn't very much data to support what we are saying. Uh, and most of the data or the literature actually comes from uh, the caesarean section uh, which are done under spinal anesthesia or epidural anesthesia. They are normally done. So uh, we have few articles we're going to talk about. Uh, so the first one is single uh, center retrospective observational study, which was published in BJA. And uh, it said that these patients, uh, there was no perioperative hemodynamic uh, changes or oxygen uh, desaturation. So they were pretty stable hemodynamically and oxygenation wise. And none of these patients developed severe pneumonia or died of pneumonia in the post-operative period. And the risk of uh, transmission was also minimal. 
In another study, uh, this is again to do with the uh, cesarean section uh, where epidural and general anesthesia were used. Again, it shows that intraoperative hypotension uh, did occur in around 86% of the patient, and uh, they, but this does not lead to any ad organ damage, and it was of short duration, so it didn't affect the hemodynamics much. In another uh, uh, case, in a series of cases, uh, 43 COVID-19 uh, positive patients, uh, these uh, were uh, delivered under neuroaxial anesthesia. Uh, there were no hemodynamic instability or neurological complications reported. The transient hypotension, which is expected uh, with neuroaxial anesthesia, uh, was uh, stabilized by using methoxamine. So one of the main things about regional anesthesia is that we need to avoid failed blocks and, and, and thus unplanned conversion to general anesthesia. Otherwise, the whole purpose of using uh, regional anesthesia is lost. So that means that the surgery uh, should be able to perform the whole surgery uh, under just regional anesthesia. So we're now going to talk about some uh, practical considerations for performing regional anesthesia in patients with COVID-19 or suspected COVID-19. One thing we need to recognize the staff, that is anesthetists or anesthesiologists who are proficient in regional anesthesia. And this then comes to the, that we need to actually have block teams. These are similar to the intubation teams uh, we have. Pre-procedural evaluation is no different from uh, that we used to do before COVID-19 for patients who required uh, neuroaxial anesthesia or peripheral anesthesia. So the indication and contraindication are the same. But one thing which is very important to notice is that COVID-19 patients were found to have thrombocytopenia, that is predilect counts less than 150,000. So in severe COVID, the incidence was considered to be 57.7%, and in non-severe COVID, it is as much as 31.6%. So it is quite significant. The other question uh, which is often asked, uh, can uh, region anesthesia lead to further impairment of respiratory function because we know COVID affects the lungs? So there are actually alternative techniques. So if you are actually uh, operating on an elbow or uh, uh, both bones forearm or on the hand, we might want to use something like axillary block and uh, or use individual blocks at the elbow for uh, distal, uh, you know, radius fractures. Or if you say you are you're going to do blocks for uh, the shoulder surgery, and then we might use phrenic sparing procedures like a combination of suprascapular nerve blocks, axillary nerve block, and uh, superficial cervical plexus block. So uh, we do actually have alternative methods of, uh, uh, you know, uh, preventing any respiratory uh, complications associated with phrenic nerve uh, blocks. Now, interoperative sedation um, can lead to respiratory depression, which means that we might actually have to then administer oxygen. Or this may even lead to airway manipulation if there's too much of sedation given. Now, this needs to be avoided. Okay. So use of sedation should be minimal or avoided altogether. And it also means that when you're using sedation, then you need to actually have respiratory monitoring. And if you need to actually give oxygen, we know that oxygen is known to spread droplets and it was considered as an independent risk factor uh, for nosocomial outbreaks uh, of SARS. So if you're using uh, oxygen, use the least amount of flow. And you need to, if you're giving oxygen through a face mask, then you need to have a surgical mask on the patient and put it over the, over the surgical mask. But if you're using nasal ca catheter, then you can actually have catheter under the mask. Okay. So patients should be wearing surgical mask at all times, irrespective of whether the patient is going to have oxygen or not, or have sedation or not they should be wearing mask at all times. They should come to theater uh, with surgical mask and the surgical mask should be on all times throughout the procedure. It's important to actually perform a safe and reliable uh, regional anesthesia so that the conversion to uh, GA is almost 0% and the complications are last or PDPH are minimal. Uh, for peripheral nerve block, uh, we should be using ultrasound guidance and the blocks need to be performed by an experienced anesthetist. So this will reduce the incidence of failed blocks and 
the complications. To ensure that the anesthesia lasts uh, for the duration of the surgery, uh, we should use long-acting local anesthetics in a safe and sufficient doses. So looking at infection protection, even though it is said that uh, regional anesthesia has lower risk of COVID-19 transmission, uh, we need to still follow the same protocols uh, as we would do for GA. That means we would actually wear the PPE, uh, which consists of surgical mask, eye protection, surgical gowns, and double gloves. And it's also important to restrict the number of staff and the equipment uh, in the operation theater. So what are the recommendations for regional anesthesia and COVID-19? Now, not the associations have brought out these uh, uh, guidelines or recommendations. And uh, this includes uh, going through pre-operative, intraoperative, and post-operative uh, period. In the pre-operative, we need to actually do a team brief, and this should be done even before you go and see the patient. This means you need to actually discuss the surgical plan, what the surgeon plans to do, how long will the surgery be? That means, will your block last the duration of surgery? Uh, what is the risk of aerosol generation? And uh, you know, what appropriate PPE uh, we need to wear for the procedure? Uh, what are the potential complications uh, which may be associated with the procedure? So all this need to be discussed before you go and see the patient and discuss with them uh, what anesthesia you're planning for them. The pre-op visits um, before you, uh, you know, visit the patient, uh, which should be actually be restricted. Uh, we need to access the case notes, go through the electronic case notes, and pre-op anesthetics should be done uh, virtually through telephone calls or video calls if possible. And if that is not possible, then we do the pre-op in the theater itself. And this is done to preserve the PPE because if you're going to go and see the patient, in the on the ward you would need to actually be in a full ppe and so you check the bloods particular attention should be paid to thrombocytopenia like i said the incidence of thrombocytopenia even in patients who do not have severe COVID, is significant it's almost around 30 to 35 percent and you need to also examine uh, for pre-existing neurological deficit and you need to document that uh, COVID has affiliation to the nerves so it is known neurological complications are known to occur with COVID. We will likely take a consent as you would normally do for any patient. You will also provide them alternative choices. Uh, you will need to discuss why uh, you are thinking of regional anesthesia rather than general anesthesia in those patients. And you need to document this discussion. Equipment, uh, you need, like we said, you need to don the PPE as meticulously as you would do for uh, general anesthesia. You need to make sure that appropriate monitoring and equipment is available to you. And only essential items should be allowed in the theaters. You need to have additional runners uh, to provide you with equipment and drugs you might actually require. For doing blocks, you might require, you will rather require ultrasound. So the ultrasound need to be covered with plastics or drapes, especially the reusable equipment such as the ultrasound and the uh, PNS. And you need to start thinking whether the handheld devices would be better than the card-based system uh, because these are easy to use and decontaminate. And you need to also think of whether you would need sedation or airway, airway rescue uh, strategies uh, in case the patient needs to, um, you know, the regional anesthesia need to convert it to uh, general anesthesia for whatever reason. As far as the patient is concerned, like I've said, patients should be transferred wearing a surgical face mask. And if you need to apply oxygen, then you can apply the oxygen mask over the surgical face mask of the patient. Uh, nasal specs can be applied under the face mask. Intraoperatively, it's important that you consider, especially for the orthopedic procedures, you consider osteotomes, myotomes, and osteotomes. And this is important because you need to actually know what the surgical approach is going to be. So it's important to discuss uh, with the surgeon uh, what they are planning to drill into, uh, what muscles they're going to go through, uh, which bones they're going to cut through. And so this is important. This knowledge is very, very important to provide uh, proper anesthesia 
And uh, I have discussed about the phrenic nerve sparing block, so you might want to do axillary block rather than a supraclavicular or infraclavicular block to spare. And for shoulders, you might want to do the suprascapular nerve block, axillary nerve block, along with uh, the uh, superficial cervical uh, plexus block to cover the skin over the shoulder. And ultrasound allows you to precisely deposit the local anesthetic uh, around the plexus or around the nerves. So ultrasound should be used in all situations. You might want to actually use adjuvants. Uh, you can give certain adjuvants intravenously, like for example, dexamethasone uh, can be given uh, IV, but it can. some people like to mix it with local anesthetic. You need to have uh, the right uh, type of local anesthesia. So long acting local anesthesia like liver BPK are safe for use. So as far as uh, technique is concerned, they not only talk about the osteomyotome dermato, the surgeons might be wanting to use tunicat. So also think of how you are going to prevent the tunicate pain. For abdominal procedure, you can give abdominal blocks, uh, but also think of the visceral uh, you know, pain. Uh, visceral pain will not be covered by your blocks, or you might actually think that, well, they, we might use neuroaxial techniques, which will actually provide both uh, visceral and somatic pain. And it's important that you use a technique uh, with the least complication, uh, but which is most appropriate, and it should be done with by the most efficient practitioner, somebody who is proficient in doing those nerve blocks. And uh, for the peripheral nerve blocks, use ultrasound, uh, use adjuvant to prolong the blocks, and um, make sure that uh, if you're using intrathecal opioids, and uh, then uh, the patient are suitably monitored, uh, you know, in a high dependency unit. And consider uh, mobile block teams. Okay. Uh, as far as siding of the blocks is concerned, it should be done in the theater only with the essential staff. And uh, patients should be wearing surgical masks throughout. Oxygen, like I've described, either face mask over the surgical mask or uh, nasal specs under the face mask should be there. And you use proper PPE and the probe should be covered uh, with the sterile sheath. Once you've done the block, it's important that I give enough time for the soaking of the local anesthetic. People call it soaking time, cooking time. Okay, that need to be you know given. Enough time need to be given. So you're looking at around 20 to 30 minutes. So that need to be added within the whole uh, you know duration of the surgery. And once you've done the block, check it meticulously. Make sure that the block is working well. And if required, you should be ready to actually provide supplementary blocks. And you need to monitor the uh, oxygen delivery and sedation, and if possible, avoid high flow oxygen and deep sedation. And even if you're not able to actually provide a supplementary block, sometimes the surgeon might need to, uh, you know, do infiltration or uh, some kind of a rescue uh, block. Uh, in that case, you need to be sure that you do not exceed the allowable safe limit of local anesthetics. And during the procedure, uh, remain maintain the two meter distance from the patient and uh, continue to monitor the patient for local anesthetic toxicity, especially if you have thought of actually giving local anesthesia through infiltration uh, to the surgeon. So keep a track of the local anesthesia used there. Postoperatively, it is important uh, that the patient is recovered within the theater and then is transferred out to the recovery or to the ward wearing a surgical mask. In the post-operative instruction, make sure that you monitor patients for adverse effect and your instructions are very clear and what are you looking for. For example, if you're given a lower limb block, make sure that the instruction there that the patient does not try to get off the ward and or off the bed and, and you know he could actually have a fall. Or if you're given a blocks for the hand, make sure that the patient's hand is in the sling because he can injure the wall, uh, the hand, you know, if it's, there's no control, motor control on that. So instructions should be very, very clear. And it's important that uh, the patient is prescribed regular post-operative analgesia, uh, especially uh, before, you know, it should be introduced before the block regression. I would rather actually say as the, the analgesia starts intraoperative itself. It also helps in uh, quality of analgesia provided intraoperatively. 
And once uh, the patient has gone to the recovery, it's important to dispose of uh, your you know, equipment uh, which has been used properly uh, or decontaminate the uh, reusable equipment like the ultrasound or the PNS uh, with appropriate material. And uh, you also doff off uh, carefully uh, in the doffing area. Documentation is very important. You document uh, the procedure clearly and document your outcomes. Uh, it should be like we have pens, uh, so it should be electronically uh, documented. Uh, you can do follow-up uh, on telephone or looking at the notes on the electronic uh, notes. And uh, the ward should be provided your contact in case patients develop any post-op complications. Uh, they should be able to contact you. And if possible, we should actually create a, a regional anesthesia database uh, for future learning as well. So coming to the end of the lecture, to summarize, um, we should consider block teams, and uh, this block team should uh, have the most experienced practitioners, uh, which will ensure maximum success. It will reduce the complication and also minimize the contact time because as an experienced uh, practitioner, they might be do, they do blocks much more quicker and more efficiently than other people. So the guidance should be uh, similar to about the airway management, like just you have intubation teams, you should actually consider block teams. And we should actually have uh, mobile uh, regional anesthesia teams uh, who can move around the theaters and provide the best block. And if possible, we could actually also have, uh, you know, uh, block rooms uh, where all the blocks are actually done. So this is also an opportunity to deliver training. Um, so for the training uh, trainees uh, who are missing out on other parts of their module core modules, uh, but also for other consultant uh, colleagues uh, who wants to refresh uh, their practice or upskill. So this is an opportunity uh, for them too. And it's important that the safest and most effective block uh, for the procedure and patient is performed. So that requires discussion uh, with the surgeons, discussion with the patients. Uh, so we should know the duration of the surgery, which areas uh, we need to block, uh, what local anesthetic or what adjuvant you're going to use. And there where the good communication comes in. So this is very, very important. Uh, so it is important that uh, this is all discussed uh, preoperatively. And it's important to have a good knowledge of the surgical anatomy is important. So knowing about the dermatomes, myotomes, osteotomes, uh, visceral components involved is very, very essential. And you should also have the knowledge of rescue blocks if required or if there has been sparing or there has been inadequate block. And before the patient is handed over to the surgeon, it's very important that meticulous testing is done uh, before the surgeon applies this knife to the skin. And the balance is tipping uh, toward regional anesthesia. We have always try to, you know, discuss which whether regional anesthesia is better than the, uh, general anesthesia. Uh, but the COVID has actually proven uh, that in situations where regional anesthesia can be used, uh, regional anesthesia uh, provides a better alternative uh, where we can provide uh, good analgesia. We can reduce the aerosol generation and exposure of the patients uh, to COVID infection. Uh, thank you for listening to the lectures and thank you very much.